Hello and welcome to State of the Economy. Today we have with us Dr. Sanjay Baru, Director of Geoeconomics at the International Institute of Strategic Studies, a London-based uh, think tank. Uh, we are talking to Mr. Baru uh, for other reasons too. Uh, more importantly, he was advisor to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and uh, in his capacity as media advisor, was very closely linked to uh, some of his foreign policy initiatives, uh, especially with uh, Japan, US and China. Uh, and uh, we now will speak to him about how the new Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, will be uh, uh, visiting uh, what could be on his agenda as he prepares to visit Japan, visit the US and uh, do a lot with China too. Uh, welcome to our show, uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru. Uh, now you have mentioned, uh, uh, talked a lot about uh, uh, Manmohan Singh's foreign policy uh, initiatives, even in your latest book. Uh, which is doing very well uh, and uh, a lot of those initiatives are being uh, taken forward uh, by Narendra Modi and I am told maybe taken really sort of uh, taking a quantum leap forward uh, in regard to Japan and the US. So what do you expect uh, from say Narendra Modi in the coming four months when he visits Japan and the US? Well, I think it's very interesting that whatever a few signals we have seen in the last three, four weeks that uh, Mr. Modi has been Prime Minister, uh, there has been in fact an acceleration in the direction defined by Dr. Manmohan Singh. Okay. You just see the news this morning's newspapers or yesterday's newspapers about India's deciding to sign the additional protocol yeah. uh, for the nuclear, uh, on the nuclear agreement sure. uh, with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. This will enable India to in fact seek membership of the nuclear suppliers group. Now this was something Dr. Manmohan Singh wanted to do, mm -hmm. but his government was not helping him uh, you know, do it. I think Mr. Modi has simply taken the next step. I expect him to take similarly next steps in a wide range of areas, mm -hmm. which will actually accelerate the process, mm -hmm. whether with the United States or with China or with China or indeed with uh, Japan. Japan. We had the visit of the Chinese Prime Minister uh, Leke Chiang a uh, couple of uh, weeks back or a few days back and we are now told that President Xi Jinping may come to India. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, and of course, the Prime Minister has decided to go and uh, meet uh, his friend, in a way, uh, Shinzo Abe, with whom he has had sure. a very strong personal equation. Yeah. You know, looking at it in a geo-economic framework, which is what your area of expertise is, uh, we learned that Modi himself is very focused on uh, geo-economics and uh, trade and economics as a primary tool uh, to... Uh, integrate India with the rest of the world and to be a player. Now, what are the possibilities uh, with Japan, uh, especially in the context of his special relationship with Shinzo Abe? And uh, I remember you wrote an article uh, some time ago in the Indian Express where you, you argued that uh, there is something special between Modi and Abe. And in fact, Modi uh, imagines, imagines himself uh, as Abe uh, for India uh, in terms of bringing about some radical transformation, uh, uh, what is it that, uh, that you imagine uh, he will do now? Well, you know, the column I wrote in the Indian Express was called The World of Narendra Abe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the argument I had was that uh, if, and this was written I think in January, uh, about six months back. And my argument was that if Mr. Modi became Prime Minister, uh, he would derive inspiration from Shinzo Abe in the pursuit of his foreign policy. Now, what, what, I, what did I mean by that? What the biggest challenge for Shinzo Abe when he became Prime Minister was to restore Japan as an economic power in Asia. Because China had overtaken Japan for the first time as Asia's biggest economy and uh, as the world's second biggest economy. And that process by, you know, that, that uh, China overtaking Japan had a tremendous psychological impact on Japan. It resulted in a virtual uh, kind of a depression within, the, within Japan about it losing that primacy it had as Asia's largest economy. And I think what Mr. Mo, uh, Abe did was through his uh, three arrows policy, mm -hmm. fiscal policy, monetary policy, yeah. structural reform, was to restore momentum to the Japanese economy. And by agreeing to become a member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and going along with the United States in a range of geopolitical initiative to restore that geopolitical relevance of Japan in Asia. 
And my argument was this is exactly what Prime Minister Modi would do because the criticism against the uh, second UPA government, the Manmohan Singh government from 2010 onwards, was that the economy had been damaged and that the damage to the Indian economy was hurting India globally. So I said that Mr. Modi's first priority would be to restore momentum to the Indian economy, exactly in the way in which Abe did. And his second priority would be to restore relationship with the United States and other major powers, including China, which would enable India to once again you know, pursue uh, global initiatives, uh, which the second UPA government was unable to take forward. Of course, the difference between uh, Japan and India is that uh, Abe does not have a good equation with, with China. Exactly. While so Mr. that's Modi, a problem area, right? That's a problem area for Abe. Because China is already asking us, uh, why are you so uh, insistent upon visiting Japan first? Well, you know, my answer to Chinese, whenever they've asked this, is very simple. China seeks a happy and a good relationship with India, but all the time says that Pakistan is their all-weather friend. India should take the same approach to seek a happy and a good relationship with China, but claim that Japan is our all-weather friend. And Japan, for India, historically, has been an all-weather friend. They've, India has had a history of a good relationship with Japan. It's just that the Japanese did not look at India in the 90s when they focused on China. That was a mistake Japan made mm -hmm. of investing more in China than in India. Sure. And that's the mistake that Abe has corrected. And in a sense, uh, Sanjay, isn't it true that China really, after it, after Deng uh, decided to uh, go the the right rightward uh, in the rightward direction, uh, they got Americans to really engage in economic cooperation in a way that never seen before, and did this did the same with Japan. Exactly. All, all the all the Japan uh, would be like in Japan. China uh, is a uh, raises a red uh, flag, you know, and, and vice versa. So, so why, why couldn't India do this? Why? India missed the bus in the 1990s. I remember meeting a series of Japanese delegations that used to come to India. It, there was a gentleman called Ishikawa mm -hmm. and he used to lead what was called the Ishikawa mission. And they would come every once in two years and give us lectures on what we should do mm -hmm. to make our economy more attractive to Japanese investment. Mm -hmm. But during that period when India was slow to reform, the Koreans overtook Japan. There was no Korean investment in India in 1991. Sure. By 2001, Korea overtook Japan as a major Asian investor in India. Mm -hmm. But during that decade, the Japanese, under this misplaced assumption that they could befriend China by investing in China, yeah. reached out to China. They massively in, invested in China. Massively invested. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing that that was a completely failed strategy yeah. because despite all the money they put into China, mm -hmm. the Chinese are giving them a lot of political problems. So the Chinese have really been very smart. They, the Chinese have been extremely smart. Yeah, they, they use the Americans, they use the Japanese uh, exactly. to glo and, and, globalize their economy. Exactly. And, and, that and what can India do now? Who do you think, <coughs> if India were to sort of adopt, say, the Chinese strategy of the 80s uh, and the 90s, uh, who should India look to for, say, a, say 40 to $50 billion worth of investments uh, in special economic zones, etc., uh, in the next five years? Who, who can Modi turn to? Modi should turn to anyone who is willing to invest in India. Including China. Including China. Mm -hmm. And certainly Japan. And certainly uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Gulf countries mm -hmm. and Saudi Arabia. There are a large number of countries with investable surpluses. Yeah. In fact, it's the Europeans who it's don't the have... Sovereign the, wealth funds of the, the Gulf sovereign countries. wealth funds. Mm -hmm. The capital account surplus that many of these countries have. Yeah. They are looking for an attractive source of investment. Mm -hmm. Europe is no longer as attractive to many of these countries sure. as, as it was in the past. Yeah. Even China is no longer as attractive mm -hmm. as it was in the past. Mm -hmm. If Mr. Modi converts India into an attractive destination, mm -hmm. all of them will come. Mm -hmm. So as far as foreign investment is concerned, I don't think we need to play favorites. We don't have to say so-and-so is preferred, so-and-so mm -hmm. is not preferred. Anyone who's willing to invest in India should be allowed to invest in India. Because after all, that investment creates employment here. It brings technology here. It creates opportunities for us. But on a strategic plane, mm -hmm. Japan has a special status. Yeah. And culturally too, I mean, I, I know Mr. Modi's favorite is uh, Swami Vivekananda. Mm -hmm. And Swami Vivekananda was one of the early Indians to travel to Japan mm -hmm. and write glowingly about the rise of an Asian power yeah. in the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. So I think Japan is a very unique place 
uh, for India and, and certainly in the case of Mr. Modi. Yeah. But the problem, uh, Mr. Baru, is that the Japanese are known to be a bit slow in, uh, in responding. Uh, that is their, part of their cultural mindset. Uh, but once they make up their mind, they, they come uh, in a big way. But uh, how do you think Modi uh, can really sort of persuade Japan to, to, to come to India in mission mode? Uh, although, of course, there are... Japanese are investing in a big way in the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, creating those seven cities. Modi is talking about you know hundred new cities. Do you think that's one area where Japan could come uh, to India in mission mode and invest say, 20, 30 billion dollars? I think for that we have to make ourselves more hospitable to foreign investment. The fact is, it's not just the Japanese. The fact is that a lot of outside investors, including many Indian businessmen, today say it's difficult to invest in India. No, we have become, in fact, more bureaucratic in our processes and procedures. Our uh, systems have become less efficient, mm -hmm. less transparent. Mm -hmm. And one of the criticisms against the previous government uh, was a, uh, the criticism of policy paralysis, mm -hmm. of crony capitalism. You know, all these criticisms, in fact, contributed to the defeat of the previous government and to the victory of Mr. Modi. So Mr. Modi's agenda is very clear-cut. Mm -hmm. He has to make India more attractive to investors, not just foreign investors, to Indian investors. In fact, I have had a strong view on this, that foreign investment will come to India when Indian investment comes to India. In the last three, four years, we have actually seen a flight of capital out of India by Indian companies. They have to return. They have to have projects. They have to show that one, India is once again an attractive place. The gross investment to GDP ratio mm -hmm. has gone down between yeah. 2009 and 2014. Sure. It has to be reversed and increased. Yeah. We'll take a small break here. Please don't go away and keep uh, watching RSTV. Welcome back to State of the Economy. We are having a conversation with Dr. Sanjay Baru, Director of Geoeconomics at the IISS. Dr. Baru, you were rightly saying that we have to create the right climate uh, for uh, foreign investment uh, from Japan, from other countries uh, too. Uh, now, what can Narendra Modi do to say, just tell me two or three things that he can do after he visits Japan, uh, talks to them and gets them to sort of come to India in mission mode and then come back and two things that he can do to make the sentiment turn. Well, as I said, I think uh, if you turn the sentiment of Indian investors, uh, that will turn the sentiment of foreign investors. Mm -hmm. So what is it that Indian investors have been complaining about? Mm -hmm. We have become too bureaucratic. Yeah. The number of clearances required. Mm -hmm. You know, India has more clearances than any other country, uh, any other emerging economy in the world. Uh, Even the World know, Bank puts India way, way, way below as an investment uh, uh, exactly. choice. Exactly. The, the ease of doing business, mm -hmm. that index, index were very, very low. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. You just look at what are the parameters on that ease of doing business index, mm -hmm. which make us go so low. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them have to do with uh, archaic laws. I think Bibek Debroy, uh, who is, uh, has had some influence over Mr. Modi, uh, has written enormously on, on this issue, mm -hmm. identified all the archaic laws. I think Mr. Modi himself has now instructed government officials, mm -hmm. you know, what are those laws which you don't even use yeah. in your particular realm? Get rid of them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and go in for major uh, restructuring mm -hmm. of the provisions for establishing a firm for you know conducting business in India, for bringing in so money, for taking out money. So essentially you're saying you have reinvent the bureaucracy. Reinvent procedures, Proceed, reinvent yeah. bureaucracy, but yeah. you know bureaucracy you is not that bad Dr. everywhere. You were saying also faced this problem. Absolutely, and you know, know I think to talk to you about it, yeah. the, the experience in India is that some state governments are more business friendly than other state governments. Mm -hmm. Certainly Gujarat was seen as business friendly, Tamil Nadu was seen as business friendly, even Andhra Pradesh during Chandra Babu Nadu's time was seen as business friendly. Mm -hmm. There are some states seen as business friendly. Mm -hmm. Learn from those states. Mr. Modi knows what it is okay. to run a business friendly government, mm -hmm. bring those ideas to Delhi, convince the bureaucracy here that you know you guys need to you know, hang loose. You know, mm -hmm. let, let uh, the animal spirits of enterprise be revived mm -hmm. by giving space. Then, if business makes mistakes, mm -hmm. have a legal framework that will c correct that. You know, strengthen regulatory institutions, mm -hmm. yeah. strengthen capital market regulatory institutions, yeah, yeah. strengthen the other you know sector wise regulatory institutions. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This, this is just one aspect of the mindset change that is needed in bureaucracy. Now, there's another aspect, which is 
a mindset change in the foreign policy bureaucracy as well as the national security bureaucracy because we've seen that our national security bureaucracy even during Vajpayee's time and, and during Manmohan Singh's time had a bias against engagement with China on various counts, Ch Chinese investments, whether it's in ports or dredging, always national security issues were raised. Uh, one doesn't know how far they were valid. Now, if, if you were if you were to invite, say, say 20, 30 billion dollars from the Chinese, they are very keen to do business with Modi uh, in a say, special economic zone. How do you get over the national security uh, psychology uh, which was there even with the Americans. You, yep. you had experienced it during yep. the nuclear deal. Correct. Uh, right. So, yeah. now how, how do you deal with these uh, psychologies? Well, partly it is psychology and that is, you are right when you say that in a foreign ministry, etc., there are old mindsets. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, the other problem is actually of systems and procedures mm -hmm. which we have put in place and that is to do with the Ministry of Home Affairs. Yeah. The Home Ministry, in fact, has made it more difficult for foreigners to come to India and function in India. Yeah. And it, you know, even the external affairs minister on many occasions has said, look, we don't want to have these procedures, but we are forced to have them because of the Home Ministry. And I think that is where the Prime Minister's office can step in. Okay. With a man like Mr. Ajit Doval as the National Security Advisor, I think you know, he has high credibility with the, uh, with the internal security establishment. Mm -hmm. He should, in fact, use that uh, credibility that he has to ease up on some of these norms. I keep telling people, no terrorist has ever taken a visa and come to India. Yeah. Only one guy called James Hadley, mm -hmm. who was involved in the Bombay 2611 thing, mm -hmm. was the one who came into India on a visa. Mm -hmm. And because of him, we have changed visa procedures mm -hmm. that have hurt you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of foreigners wanting to come to India. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, every other terrorist, including the guys who came from Pakistan in Mumbai in mm -hmm. uh, 2011, they don't ask for a visa to come in. Mm -hmm. It's the legal people who want to come in with a visa, sure. make it easier for them. And you know, you, do you think Modi has the right people around him, you spoke about Dawal, who can bring about a transformational change in relations with say China or with the US. Japan is not such a problem. Uh, for instance, uh, with the US, the nuclear liability clause has been a thorn in our flesh. Uh, you know, again, there's a mindset there needs to be a mindset change on that. How will a solution come about on that? Uh, so how do you think, uh, uh, you know, like, you can imagine how Kissinger and Nixon would have rewritten the rules when they started engaging with uh, China and how they would have dealt with their bureaucracies uh, in a transformational uh, way. So well, you don't have to go all the way back to Kissinger and Nixon, even George Bush. Mm -hmm when he d decided to do the nuclear agreement with India, mm -hmm. had to overrule his bureaucracy because American bureaucracy was still very hostile towards India. Mm -hmm. And Manmohan Singh overruled his bureaucracy. So can Modi with 282 seats? 282 you don't seats. need 282 seats. Okay. You, you need imagination. And Mr. Modi has that imagination. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think we already have those signals. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, his decision to sign the additional protocol, mm -hmm. I think is a very clear signal that on the nuclear, um, civil nuclear policies, mm -hmm. he is going to walk, this, walk the talk. So what will he do when he goes to the US? Will he take a solution to the uh, nuclear oh, li sure. liability uh, I am pretty sure. That's the message I read. Will he take the risk off the balance sheet of companies? Uh, well, I don't know what exactly he will do, but I can tell you the message I read from this decision to sign the additional protocol mm -hmm. is that Mr. Modi is saying that my attitude is different. Go back to the debate in India on the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. The BJP was divided, just as the left was divided. I can tell you, mm -hmm. as I've written in my book, that Sitaram Yachuri in the left was quite willing to go along with Manmohan Singh on mm -hmm. the nuclear deal. It is Prakash Karat who opposed it. Similarly, in the BJP, mm -hmm. Mr. Arun Jaitley was quite willing to work with the government. Mm -hmm. It was Adwani and his uh, supporters, including Sushma Swaraj, who at that time were creating the problem mm -hmm. on the nuclear liability bill, for example. So I would imagine that Mr. Modi, who was not part of this group, he was sitting in Gujarat running his government, will come with an open mind mm -hmm. and look at what is practical, what is necessary, what is in India's national interest, and pursue a pragmatic policy, which I think all the signals in the last three, four weeks mm -hmm. suggest that you are going to see a pragmatic government. And you ask the question about who, does Mr. Modi have people around him? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think all the appointments he has made, Ripendra Mishra as his principal secretary, Ajit Dover as NSA, are 
are, are of people who are professionals. I know both of them personally and they're professionals. But more importantly, I think the message is the ideas come from him, the orders come from him. Mm -hmm. He will run the show. So, yeah. you know, that's okay. You know, there's some, uh, some think tanks uh, in Beijing and Shanghai have very interestingly characterized Narendra Modi as somebody who uh, who would probably believe in uh, Asian capitalism. Uh, he would be like some of the heads of government of a a Asian capitalist uh, regimes. How do you respond to this characterization? Well, you know, the Chinese keep saying these things. But uh, probably they're also implying that he won't be like a Western, uh, he, won't, he won't run a Western capitalist regime, you know, more like an Asian yeah, capitalist. Yeah. I mean, the Chinese have played this game for a long time. Mm -hmm. Whenever India comes close to the United States, they get nervous. Mm -hmm. Whenever I India and the U.S. have arguments, the Chinese feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think in the next half a century, this will be the global game. This, this trilateral dance mm -hmm. between China, India and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Because the U.S. is the world's number one power. Mm -hmm. It will continue to try to retain that status. Mm -hmm. China is the world's number two power it will continue to try to become a number one power. So the primary contradiction, if you like, in the gl global system would be China's aim to become number one and the U.S. aim to remain number one. Mm -hmm. But the secondary contradiction would be India's aim to become number one first in Asia and then globally. Frankly, I do not see why not in the year 2047 when India celebrates its centenary as a, uh, uh, as a republic mm -hmm. and a democracy and a free country, India cannot overtake China and become the world's largest economy. Sure. You know, next 30 years, it's possible. Mm -hmm. China has become the world's second largest in a matter of 20 years. Mm -hmm. So in theory, it's not difficult to do that. But in any case, India, uh, India's attempt uh, to become the world's second largest economy uh, and the uh, Asia's largest economy uh, would in fact be the uh, you know the issue. So this is the trilateral will go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And I think there our relationship Japan is very important mm -hmm. because Japan has money, Japan has technology, Japan has strategic uh, depth in, uh, in Asia. Uh, so Japan is a country, as I keep saying, can be the truly all weather friend of India. Sanjay, so, but on the ground, it's very interesting that that if you look at Indian private sector, they are importing the bulk of infrastructure equipment, as it were, from China. Because China today uh, provides the cheapest infrastructure equipment around the world. The Americans have recognized this. Americans have even conceded it. Uh, I met a G uh, American uh, CEO of General Electric, and he said that it was remarkable how the Chinese uh, took technology from the US uh, reverse engineered and and they are producing Jeep uh, power equipment much cheaper and of equal quality, equally good quality. Now, does, doesn't that give China a huge advantage? Because the bulk of, uh, I'm told about 25% of all power plants planned in the next five years are, ch are on Chinese equipment. So, so does that make China a natural partner in India's infrastructure building? No, so we, 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 India, every company will buy from wherever it can buy cheaply. Cheap, yeah. So China and, is the uh, cheapest actually. Yeah, so it's yeah. not a question of partnership. It's a commercial relationship. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you buy from a country which is selling. They need to sell, we need to buy. You don't need a partnership for that. It's yeah. a commercial relationship. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day... No, when, I mean, when I say partnership, can India and China have a limited FTA in goods and no, services? No, 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 I, exactly. Uh, yeah. let, let me come to that question. Yeah, yeah. You know, frankly, China has emerged as the manufacturer of the world in the last 20 years. Sure. In the next 20 years, India must overtake China, or at least India must emerge as the second most important manufacturing uh, center of the world, and why not even the first? Yeah. Because as a large country of 1.2 billion people, mm -hmm. a continental nation that we are, mm -hmm. we cannot depend on other countries for things like you know, infrastructure equipment. Mm -hmm. you know, we should be building our own roads, yeah. we should be building our own power plants, we should be building our own defense sector, mm -hmm. you know, our own ships, in, the shipping industry will be extremely important for India sure. right through the 21st century. Yeah. And yet we are dependent on the world today for our ships. Mm -hmm. That has to change. Yeah. Our ambition 
should be to actually do what China did over the last 20 years in the next 20 years. But how and do industrialize. We, how, how do we do it? I mean, do That's we, what I'm we, saying. That out is, of their strategy? We can't because we are a democracy. <coughs> We, we, we are a democracy. Mm. We cannot do everything that the Chinese did. We have to be mindful of the interests of Indian people, mm. whether it's on land policy or environment policy or labor policy. These are all things. That is why it's more complicated and more complex. But I don't see why India cannot do it. And, and there are parts of India where I mentioned uh, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu uh, or even Andhra Pradesh for that matter or Karnataka, which have shown the way forward for other states. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's no reason why this experiences of building urbanization, mm -hmm. industrialization, which is already there in India, mm -hmm. cannot be replicated. Mm -hmm. And we build a hundred cities around the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I come from Hyderabad. I think Telangana can prosper mm -hmm. if cities towns like Karimnagar and Warangal become industrial hubs and you have high speed train connectivity, high speed road connectivity, you know, spread industry out. Okay. Uh, so essentially you're saying that India needs to adopt a domestically driven growth strategy while cooperating with the rest absolutely, of the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much for talking to us, uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru. That's all we have in this uh, episode of uh, State of the Economy. We'll be back with you next week. Uh, thanks for watching.